Good morning, everyone. Welcome to End of Mission, the podcast where I draw the sun differently every time. I'm the pressure-fed astronaut, also known as Paul, the guy who draws the sun differently every time, apparently. <laughs> like, it's everyone mad. Why is everyone complaining about that? It's just, it's kind of weird, right? Because you, you, you'd expect somebody to draw it the exact same way every single time. But the fact that you keep drawing it differently, that's a little, it's a little concerning there, bud. <laughs> Who are you? Oh, um, I'm your imaginary friend slash face of sarcasm. I'm the, an absolute idiot and the buffoon who doesn't understand anything about space travel and asks you a bunch of dumb questions. That's who I am. Yeah, dumb questions like, why do you draw the sun differently? Every single time. <laughs> yeah. It's just, it's always different. You always start at a different spot. It's, it's weird. It's not. Why did you... It's pick- like... I why why do you draw the sun different every single time? I don't know. <laughs> also, for those of you listening, you will notice I sound so much better. That's because I Hopefully. I, I hope so. I got a better kazoo. <laughs> yeah, upgraded. Okay, so today's mission we're talking about is STS fifty one A. Awesome. Why is it? Why, why did they change the naming scheme? Because the last time we did, like, STS-7, because that was the 7th mission. Why did they change the, the naming scheme? Uh, apparently, the guy in charge of numbering had Triskaidekaphobia, which is the fear of the number 13. Also, I think NASA wanted to make a confusing system for naming flights because I think they were trying to hide the low flight rate. Oh. It's a little, uh, a little, uh, little manipulation there on everyone's part. Yeah. All right, so this is STS-51A. What do you think the mission's about? Um, space. Yes, we wouldn't be talking about it if it wasn't about space. Okay. So you can see, you know, you got an eagle, and you got a big old satellite. So what do you think it's about? Um, I'm assuming the satellite, unless they're trying to put an eagle into space. That would be. I don't think it'll fly too well. That'd be really cool. Just have an eagle on board. You'd be pretty sure it's illegal to kill bald eagles. Yeah, it'd be really funny, though, to have it in the cabin. It just gets mad at everyone. <laughs> that would be pretty funny, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like, I'm constantly flying, but why? <laughs> yeah. I just confuse it. How patriotic are you now, buddy? <laughs> okay, so let's get started with some serious things. Right. Did I miss something? No, there's no background. Okay. All right, so here's the crew that's flying on this mission. Okay. So our commander is Frederick Rick Hawk. We saw him last on STS-7 where he was the pilot. Ah, right. hey Rick, how's it going? Yep, and this is, I didn't pick his official astronaut photograph because I figured if we're going to see this guy again, we should do a different photo of him. So this is actually a photo of him on the mission. Oh, nice. Yeah, he looks pretty happy. Uh, so he was yeah. born April 11th, 1941. Also, we're repeating some of this data because I don't think anyone will ever watch STS-7 because of how bad it sounds. So okay, yeah okay, uh, that's your fault, by the way. I'm blaming you. Of course, yeah, because you're the one with the the kazoo. Yeah, it's my kazoo. It's clearly my fault. Yeah, my kazoo, your problem. Okay, so he's from Long Beach, California, and he was a Navy pilot before joining NASA. He's part of Astronaut Group Eight, also known as the TFNGs, the effing new guys. His previous mm. spaceflight history is he was the pilot on STS Seven. Wow, incredible. Yeah. Our pilot is David M. Walker. He was born May 20th, 1944, and he did die on April 23rd, 2001. He's from Columbus, Dang. Georgia, and he was a Navy pilot. Incredible. Yeah. Uh, he has no previous space flight history. He's part of the TFNGs. But, okay. as a fun fact, he was a consultant on the movie Deep Impact. Oh, cool. That's... That's fascinating. It's, uh, it's good that they had him on there because of how accurate the movie is. Deep Impact is much more ar- accurate than Armageddon, at least. Yeah, well, what do you expect from uh, Michael Bay? Yeah. All right. So now, our mission specialists one and two. So mission specialist one is Joseph P. Allen. He was born June 27th, 1937 in Crawfordsville, Indiana. He has a Ph.D. in physics from Yale. Oh, Yale, man. Yes. I was thinking about that, too. And for those who don't know, that's a, that's a reference to a Gilligan's Island episode. Hey, that was the one with Kurt Russell in it. 
Oh yeah, yeah, a, Jungle a Boy, small boy. Oh, he's a teenager a small in that. Small boy, Kurt Russell. <laughs> yeah. So if you're over the age of forty, you understand this joke we've made. If you're under the age of forty, yeah. well, sorry. <laughs> Ask your parents or grandparents. <laughs> Probably grandparents at this point. Yeah. Hi, mom. <laughs> <laughs> or no, Dad made us watch Gilligan's Island. Uh, so he's actually from Astronaut Group Six. He oh. was, yeah, he was the second batch of scientist astronauts that were meant for Apollo. So he was actually oh. a mission scientist and support personnel for Apollo 15. Okay. He was then NASA ad- assistant administrator for legislative affairs in Washington D.C. That sounds exciting. Oh, it's yeah. Who doesn't love being? An assistant administrator for legislative things. Ew. Yeah, that sounds like. Dang, he's an astronaut and an assistant administrator for legislative affairs. Wow. Yeah. How incredible. So then he was support crew on STS one, and then he was a mission specialist on STS five. Okay. So, and then so missions. A lot of, a lot of fun. Yeah, he's experienced. Mm-hmm. And, and look at that face. That face says experienced. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. So then mission specialist number two is Anna L. Fisher. Uh, she was born August 24th, 1949. What's today's date? The 26th. So happy birthday to her, belated. Happy birthday. Congratulations. Yep. She was from New York City, New York. She was a chemist and emergency physician. So it's technically she's also Dr. Fisher. Oh, she's from nice. astronaut group eight, as you can probably guess, <laughs> woman, mm-hmm. uh, she has no spaceflight history. Obviously, she worked extensively on the remote manipulator system. She also helped work with the spacesuits to get them ready for women to use because they're all designed for the fellas. But now you got women folk right. on the plane. Yeah, the, not the plane. Oh, gosh. The plane. Yes. Yeah, the big brick plane yeah. up in the sky yes. space. Yeah. Well, if you ask flat earthers, it's a plane. Uh, of course. And then she supported su- shuttle integration activities uh, at the Kennedy Space Center. Because when you're an astronaut, you don't just get to you know go to press things and be cool. You actually have to do, like, boring stuff. <laughs> like being an assistant administrator for legislative affairs? Yes, the exciting uh, things. So here's some fun facts. Joe Allen was a consultant and appeared in Armageddon. <laughs> <laughs> Could you imagine those crew meetups, right, those big NASA things, they bring all the old shuttle astronauts in, and they look at each other, you. <laughs> yeah. Can you imagine that? It's like, hey, wait a second. <laughs> yeah, at least I was in it. <laughs> uh, yeah, so that that must have been fun. <laughs> oh man! Yeah. Uh, so Anna Fisher was the first mother in space, and does, actually designed our mission patch. So if you actually if you look at it, it's got so there's five crew, but there's six stars. The sixth one oh. is her daughter. Hey, yeah. that's nice. Yeah. She wanted to become an astronaut after listening to the radio broadcast of Alan Shepard's flight. So that's pretty cool. Oh, dang. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. And then Mission Specialist 3 is Dale Gardner, rocking that stash. Look at that thing. Yep. He was born November 8th, 1948. He died February 19th, 2014. And he's from Fairmont, Minnesota, which means he's the coolest person here. Just so we're clear, (laughs) Fairmont is within driving distance of where we're from. Oh, nice. Yeah. So, <laughs> so he's from Minnesota. Oh, there, you know. yeah. Huh? See, boy, oh, he yeah. picked a, he brought some good hot dish on this one, you know. Oh, I hope so. Yeah. I hope he, he puts on that space suit and keeps nice and warm up there oh, in space. Yeah. I heard it's real cold. Don't want to get him sick. Oh, yeah. Kind of like in the movie Fargo, you know. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, so he's from Fairmont, Minnesota, which, uh, yeah, so he's cool. He's from Astronaut mm-hmm. Group 8. He was mission support for STS-4 and then a mission specialist on STS-8. Awesome. So he's got some space flight history. Uh, so our orbiter on this flight is Discovery, OV-103. Mm-hmm. This actually isn't a picture from this mission. This was from the previous flight. I couldn't find one of it being integrated. Oh, okay. There's not much documentation for this mission, unfortunately. Ah. Yeah. Uh, this is Discovery's second flight. So the previous flight was okay. its first, uh, STS-41D. And then this is the 14th shuttle mission of the program. Which is why it's called 51A. Yes. Right. And then it's carrying three EMUs. Uh, that's Carrying three birds? Yeah, birds that 
well, yeah, we, we can't carry Australians on the mission. The bird would win. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's true. So the one fun fact of this mission is it's the first TFNG mission commander, Rick Hawk. Ah, uh, yeah. Yep. Nice. And this is a crew photograph I thought it was cool because that's an eagle. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Isn't that cool? <laughs> that's so awesome. Bro. Yeah. So here is a bit of background for this. So on STS-41B, so that's the mission where this photograph comes from. This is one of the oh. most iconic photographs of space exploration ever. <laughs> Mm-hmm. It's from STS-41B. So that was February 1984. Challenger deployed two HS-376 communication satellites from the payload bay. So just like on STS-7, uh, that's these guys oh. right here. Okay, the ones that, like, spin up and you, you launch them from the yeah, back. They go, they go. Nice. Well, something went wrong on both of them. <gasps> so what happened is this motor fired, sputtered, and then died. <gasps> Twice. Uh-oh. It did it twice? On both engines. Yeah, on both of these vehicles. So it's, this is West Star 6 and Palapa B2. And these are the actual spacecraft. Oh. Yeah. So West Star 6 was left in a 650 by 160 mile orbit. So it's about 1,000 kilometers by 250 kilometers, which is you know not a geostationary transfer orbit like it was supposed to. And mm-hmm. Palapa B2 was stuck in the same place, roughly. Okay. So now what do you do? Uh, you go up there and, I don't know, beat it into submission? You swear at it, of course. So mm-hmm. so what likely happened is uh, the nozzle separated. It fell off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So What happened? Well, the engine fell off. Yeah, the nozzle <laughs> fell off. So it just kind of sputtered. So Thiokol takes the blame, obviously. Uh, $180 million in insurance claims are filed only for Palapa. Because Westar was supposed to be on an Ariane flight, and that got, I think the Ariane blew up before then, so they moved it. And part of the Mm. agreement for moving to the shuttle was that if the star didn't work, uh, it wasn't Thiokol's fault. Oh, okay. But an idea is born. Oh? I think it was Joe Allen or Dale Gardner thought of this. So here's the thing. Think of this spacecraft. What orbit is it in? It's in a pretty low orbit. It's an orbit accessible to the shuttle. Inclination uh, yeah. and perigee, right? Uh-huh. Now, you have this. This is called the MMU, the Manned Maneuvering Unit. It's a little jetpack on the back of the spacesuit, right? Okay. And on STS-41C, the space shuttle grappled and repaired the Solar Maximum spacecraft in the payload bay. Oh, okay. So now, STS-51A goes from a SPOG-standard two-satellite deployment mission with some science experiments to a rescue mission. Oh, okay. Yeah. There's some other things that are happening on board. There's two other science experiments. Okay. One is the 3M diffusive mixing of organic solutions. Okay. That, that's obvious, right? I don't you didn't even explain it. You're putting stuff together and seeing what happens. So you have two types of experiments on these. So the first one is on the three chambers, one of them has an organic solution. So that's like a hydrocarbon, right? That's a carbon thing. Organics, carbon. Okay, okay. On one end of the reactor, while the other two are filled with incompatible solvents, so that when they mix, they'll cause the uh, organics to crystallize out of the solution. Okay, so make, like, crystals? Yeah, pretty much. It's crystal growth, man. Okay. And the second one is, so you have, of the two chambers, the two outer chambers are made with uh, the the organics, with the middle one being the solvent. And then they'd mix, and the byproduct would be less soluble than the rest, and they'd crystallize out. Okay, so it's like the one-to-two mixture versus a two-to-one mixture. I think so. I couldn't find anything on this experiment except what the press kit has. So, sorry. I, couldn't, I really okay. couldn't find anything on it. That's so there's okay. six reactors flying on this mission. The first one has urea. Uh, that's exactly what you think it is. Oh, God. Yep. In a toluene methanol solvent mix. So that stuff, you know, I don't, I don't know what any of this is. I, mean, I know what methanol is. I make that in the backyard with tree stumps. Uh, and then the second one has cyanine, Tosylate and 
tetraethylammonium oxenol, of course, in chloroform. As what kind of mission you're running you here? Do. Yeah, How you get this? this all seems normal to yeah, me. All t- this is stuff you buy, you know, at the, the corner drugstore, you know. Oh, Anyone yeah. could do I remember this. just the other day I had to pick up some of my cyanide uh, silate. Yeah, and then the, you got some tetraethylammonium oxenol. I mean, everyone gets that. Yeah. You know? yeah, everyone gets that, yeah. Luckily, I'm not a chemist, so I have no idea what any of this is. I mean, I know what urea is. Everyone knows what that That's is. That's about it. <laughs> uh, so theoretically, this should have made a cy- cyanooxanol salt. Wait, I think cyan... So cyano, I think that's... It's uh, it, a color, right? That's like a blue, well, bluish green color. Yeah, it's cyan, but I think it's like a carbon nitrogen thing. I am not a chemist. <laughs> what makes the meth blue? Uh, the script. Uh, so the uh, third reactor is the same as the as number two, and then four through six are proprietary. So we don't know. Oh, so there's just <laughs> stuff's in them. <laughs> and so then this is the experiment right there. There's Anna Fisher showing it off. Nice. And the second one is the radiation monitoring equipment, RME. So it's these little handheld devices powered by 9-volt batteries. They're measuring radiation on orbit at certain times. So it's basically just a Geiger counter. Yeah, a small one. Yeah. Okay. So it's in the payload bay. All right. So up front, so we got up front, this is where the crew is. This is where they sleep. Then you have mm-hmm. MMU and FSSs. So that's man maneuvering unit and then uh, foot support for when you're like on the RMS and that sort of thing. Okay. Behind that are the West Star and Palapa retrieval pallets. We'll see more of those in the pictures. Okay. Behind that is Onik D2. That's an HS376. There's my typo. It's a six. Communication satellite bus with a Pam D. And then behind okay. that, this is a big one. This is a Syncom 4-1, also known as LeSat F-1. This is an HS-371 bus military communication satellite. This is the only satellite bus designed exclusive to launch on the space shuttle. Ooh. Yeah. Everyone... Wait, only one up until now or only one ever? It's the only one. Oh. One of the arguments for the space shuttle that I forgot to mention when we did the first episode was... Well, you have the big space shuttle with the big payload bay. Everyone will start making payloads differently. That didn't happen. Did that happen? No. Oh, that didn't happen. There's a certain so, uh, there's a certain other rocket that's using this argument. Mm-hmm. We're gonna press X to doubt on that one. Just saying. No, I'm pretty sure it'll work. It'll work this time. I mean, it's not like we have any historical precedents yeah. to indicate that it doesn't do that. If you build it, they will come. Yeah. All right. So here's some weights here. You know, it's things to lift. So the MMUs uh, collectively weigh about 1,500 pounds, uh, which is like 670 kilograms. Uh, you got the pallet attaches, which are about 10,000 pounds. Syncom is a heavy satellite at 17,000 pounds, 7.7 metric tons. Yeah. That's me at Thanksgiving, right? <laughs> yeah. I'm really fat. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, and Anik, of course, is about 10,000 pounds. I mean, have you seen those turkey dinners? They're pretty good. It's it's delicious. You get all the stuffing. Oh, and the mashed potatoes. When's Thanksgiving? That's in a couple of months, right? It's in three months. Yeah, so it's right around the corner. Yeah. I like these images, by the way. These are fun. As you can see how big this... Callouts and diagrams? Yeah. These are really good. Yeah, that is a thick satellite. Okay, so these are the spacecraft again. So this, of course, is Onik D2. Hey, this looks... Vaguely familiar. We saw this last time in STS-7, the episode that no one will ever watch. Uh, Mm -hmm. So when it actually gets into orbit, it's going to weigh about 1,500 pounds. Uh, It's going to operate at 3.72 to 4.18 gigahertz. That's the C-band. And it's going to be placed at 111.5 degrees west, which is straight south of Salt Lake City, for reference. Oh, okay. Yeah, so it's pretty much in line with Salt Lake City. All right, so the mountain mountain time zone. Yeah. But for Canadians, so, you know, for their hockey. Oh. Yeah. Oh. So, like, Alberta or something. Yeah. One of those. They're not real states, okay? Not a real country. Yeah. So then yeah, Syncom. Canadians. Yeah. Syncom uh, 41 Lease Sat F1, as it's called, so called. Uh, when it reaches orbit, it's going to weigh about 1.4 metric tons. This thing's 14 feet in diameter. Jeez. Also me on Thanksgiving. Uh, it's about 20 feet tall. And this is a, an exploded diagram of it. You can see. Okay. Yeah. It's got these cool antennas. It's not supposed to do that, right? Hopefully. You never know. 
And it's the antennas are different than what you get here, where this looks like your like uh, like satellite TV dish. These look like like guns. It's like, oh, oh go. sweet, like ray guns. They're gonna like shoot down uh, hockey players from orbit or something. Well, this one's a, for military purposes, so yes. Ah, cool. Now I don't know what frequency it operated on because it's a, a military satellite. Uh, it's, mm-hmm. It operates an ultra high frequency. It's going to be placed at 105 degrees west, so it's to the east of uh, Onik. Now, LeaseSat spacecraft are built by Hughes and leased to the United States government for military communications. That's why it's called LeaseSat. Ah, uh, so it's basically like rent a sat. Yeah, and the funniest thing is, while this is the first yeah. one, it's the second one to be launched. <laughs> uh oh. Yeah, there's some the first one. Well, no, this is the first one. Right. Okay. So. It's- Second, you say you said it was the second one to be launched. Yeah, because it had there was something wrong with the antenna they had to fix, so they launched the second one first. Oh, yeah. So we, okay. Yeah, they just swapped them out. Don't worry. Okay, so mission timeline, mission day one. So the original launch date was going to be November seventh, nineteen eighty four, because you know STS fifty one A, you know the mm-hmm. first flight of nineteen eighty five in November. Of nineteen eighty four. Yep. yep. Uh, That's right. Supposed to launch at 8.18 in the morning, Eastern Standard Time, but upper-level winds pushed it to the next day. Those are really strong winds. I mean, they push you into the future, man. (laughs) Yeah, that's pretty good. (laughs) Now, the interesting thing is, because I've read about this in the mission uh, press kit, is the target orbit, because it got a rendezvous with the satellites, meant that the window happened 32 minutes earlier every day. So it gets pushed back half an hour every day. And there's a five-day window every 45 days to do it. Because orbital mechanics is weird. It's not like yeah, it's not like Kerbal Space Program. Uh, so now Discovery lifts off at seven fifteen in the morning, seven hundredths of a second late, miserable failure. <gasps> uh, Shit. Ugh, unbelievable. In the morning, which oh gosh, see at seven fifteen for me, that's when I'm getting ready to commute. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but you have to be. You can't be seven one hundredths of a second late. Yeah. Uh, So, day one of the mission is mostly just starting up the experiments and preparing for satellite retrieval. I'm sure they got a lot of communication from the the flight director saying, like, you were so late. You're you're getting written up now. Gene Kranz was actually uh, in mission control for this flight, too. So, he was probably, he's like, oh, back in Apollo, you know. (laughs) We were all tough and competent. (laughs) We would never never accept that. Yeah. Uh, So, mission day two is not really interesting. Also, there's some orbit phasing, orbit raising, right? They try to get the correct orbits. They also deploy Onyx D2. So, that's a picture of it. It looks like they're deploying it in a swimming pool. They're not. Why? Yeah, why is it green? Uh, That's because it was taken at night. Yeah, it's they deploy. Yeah, well, why is it green though? I, I think it's the camera they were using. The, the site I use, they do the raw images, so some of them are unprocessed or processed differently. Because there's, there's a few pictures uh, you can find of some other missions where it looks like they're in the cabin, but the cabin is you know a swimming pool. <laughs> you know what I'm thinking, okay. right? Uh, so yeah, yeah, it's like the un- the raw footage is slightly greener than yeah. than when it is processed and and properly now color corrected. Yeah. So now, of course, on this flight. The perigee kick motor, there's a camera on it in case the nozzle falls off again. <laughs> Which, that footage must be really cool. Maybe. Yeah. yeah. I, don't, I don't think anyone has it. I think it's proprietary and you'll never see it. But that'd be really cool Probably. if the, it's available to find it. Actually, I did find the deployment footage of... Uh, there's a really big fold-out satellite dishes that are used on certain satellites, like the Sirius XM satellites. And there's actual mm-hmm. footage of it deploying up at... Uh, up in orbit you can find really? it yeah oh that's awesome yeah it's really cool also you, see, you can see the the pallets here this is the pallet for recovering the other satellites we'll see more Got of it. these in the future okay all right so this is what happens to the onic of course they launch it it does a perigee kick kicks the apogee all the way up to geostationary where it's supposed to be and then mm-hmm. you know it fires the there's a solid motor inside it of course that kicks the apogee mm-hmm. all the way up so it raises perigee so it's a geostationary orbit. They tweak the motor. They you know unfold it. They pop it open. Watch some cocky and syrup and you know stare at mounties. I guess. Yeah, ride horses and eat maple leaves or whatever. Really? Whatever it is that Canadians yeah, do. That's yeah. So mission day three is the deployment of Syncom four one. Some maneuvering and the preparations of uh, the emus getting ready for that. So. 
Right. This is what the satellite looks like. Oh, it's, a, it's got the ray guns. Yeah. Isn't that cool? That is awesome. So unlike, so you can see it being deployed here. So unlike the HS-376 buses, which, you know, they're loaded you know, upwards, this is on its side. And what they do is on one side of the Syncom is a spring that pushes it. So, yeah. <laughs> so it's spring-loaded and just boop. Yep. So it, it imparts a spin, so it spins away, and it goes straight up. It's called the Frisbee oh, nice. method. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, so this is a really good picture. Look at that. Isn't that crisp? It's beautiful. Yeah. Also, I, I did link the place where you can get see these images. There's a lot of really good ones. I wanted to put a lot of them in this, but I didn't. Aww. I put plenty in, don't worry, but it's not. Thank you. All of them. So mission day four is preparation for recovery operations. Uh, this is the day for if they had troubles deploying these two satellites, they could do it instead. It's backup day. Okay. They always plan that into these missions. So this is what happens got with... It. So Syncom is different. So it's got a perigee kick motor. So it's going to kick it up to the geostationary. And it's going to do some phasing orbits first. So it's going to raise mm. it up to the correct orbit it's going to be and then use internal liquid motors to push it itself into orbit. Okay. That's why it's so heavy. Ah. Yeah. And it deploys and you know, fires the ray guns at our, at our enemies. Or the Canadians. Probably the Canadians. Yeah, they are our enemies. Mm-hmm. What's wrong with it? They're not American. Yeah, what's that all about, right? Ugh. Yeah. They say sorry. Uh, they will be sorry after this, you know? Uh. All right. So now, mission day five. This is the recovery of Palapa. Now, okay. between February and November, they slow down the spacecraft because it starts at a 50 RPM spin for the deployment, right? You've mm -hmm. seen the footage of that. They slow it to one RPM, and they lower the orbit so the shuttle can actually recover it. Okay. They run to, so this is it over here. This is from the... Uh, uh, I'm pretty sure that's a UFO. Yeah. Bigfoot. That's, this, is so the po this is from the post-flight uh, briefing. Mm -hmm. Nice recordings. Uh, again, I've linked that in the description for you to watch. It's really cool. This is where I get some of the screenshots from. Um, so this is the rear end of the satellite, as you can see. Okay. So we're looking at the business yeah, end. this is the business end. This is, yeah. So there used to be a star... Uh, 48 motor here. It's gone. They detached it. So they rendezvoused with this. Oh, I thought, did it fall off? Well, they jettisoned it, hopefully. Okay. Well, actually, uh, there's a future mission that it didn't jettison properly. So I had to go fix it. Ooh. Yeah, we'll talk about that later, though. So they recover. Uh, they recover. They rendezvoused with the satellite at 8 a.m. So, you know, you, right? You wake up. You Bright get, and early uh, at the morning. Yep. Got to get your morning coffee and get out there. The satellites are coming. Yep. So we have EV-1 is Joe Allen. So he's the guy with the red stripes on his spacesuit. EV-2 okay. is Dale Gardner. He has no stripes on his spacesuit. This is for reference okay. when we start looking at the pictures. So Joe's got stripes. Dale does yep. uh, Anna Fisher is on the RMS. That's what she does best. Uh, Rick Hawk is maneuvering Discovery. And then Walker is the support crew. What does that mean? Uh, he's there in case something goes wrong. Oh, so he's he, oh, he's moral support. Yeah. He's just... yeah. You, you, you can do it. Yeah, you're doing great, guys. Yeah. So now, over the next six hours, the astronauts are going to bring the satellite into the payload bay. Oh, wow. Yeah. So it's a, it's a whole day of work. It's working. a whole day. All right, so this is Joe in his spacesuit, and this is Dale. Okay. Yep. <laughs> I'm going to have more pictures. By the way, there's more pictures in this one because it's mostly a visual thing. Makes sense. All right. So here's what they're going to do for the first step. So what? So right now, EV-1, so that's Joe, he's going to go out to the satellite that they've rendezvoused with, and he's going to stick mm -hmm. this re, uh, the AKM capture device. So in as I said before, the HS-376 has a solid motor inside of it, right? So okay. he's going to use this probe, and since it's a hollow tube, right, mm -hmm. what he's going to do is he's going to stick this inside the Apogee kick motor, and it's going to have little uh, spikes come out right here, fold mm -hmm. out and act like an, um, like an umbrella, and it's going to hold it. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it's going to go in there, expand out, and like so, grab onto yeah, so it inside of the motor. So, he's, so you can see he's pretty much like, kind of like riding it, right? Mm -hmm. and, like a witch on her broom, that kind of thing. Right? Uh -huh. And he's going to bring, use the MMU to bring it back close to the RMS can grapple on to this. Right? That's, like, that's the grapple fixture. Right. Uh, so the idea actually came to them. It's either Joe or Dale came up with it. Both say it was the other, right? Because they're all professionals on how they came up with it. Right. They came to work one day when they're preparing for the mission. It's like, I have the idea. I know how to do this. So, <laughs> okay. 
Okay. So this is the uh, exploded view of the capture device. So you can see it's got the different parts. It's got the control box. It's got little levers. Uh, mm -hmm. right? So there's then there's the the toggles you can use, and there it is locked in the payload bay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So this will fit around That's the solid kick motor, right? So you saw before uh, with this picture. Yeah, right? there's like the yeah, there's the circle at the back. So right there yeah. is the apogee kick motor. It's the darker spot that you really can't see. Okay. All right. So then, this is, these are actual photographs from the mission. Now, these might be from the second recovery because the first time, I think this is the first time because the sun was in their eyes the whole time. Uh, so this, yeah, that's, that's going to yeah. be painful. So the second time, they actually angled the shuttle so the nose was putting them in shade when they recovered the spacecraft. So this one is, I do believe, uh, the Palapa being recovered by Joe. This one might be Dale. It okay. wasn't differentiated in the, uh, the labels, but you can see what's going on, right? These are mm -hmm. pictures. So they're sending a remote manipulator in to go grapple on. Right. So now, part two is they'll grapple it, and they'll move it in and hold it upside down, kind of like a blizzard uh, from Dairy Queen, over the payload bay. Because cause it, cause the problem is, right, you got the capture device on the back, and you want to mount it mm -hmm. in there. We got to get the capture device out. So yeah, right. so uh, yeah. Well, uh, is that part of this? We'll talk. It's in the next slide. So, okay. So they have it upside down, and then the next thing we're gonna do is I'm gonna cut off this antenna. Yeah, this antenna right here. Uh -huh. Yeah, with garden shears. Just snap it off. With garden shears, they'll cut it off. Okay. And what so they're gonna do? So what they have to do is gonna put it. Uh, it's called the A-frame over this, so that they can grapple it on that side to put it in. All right. So okay. you can kind of see. So there it is. There's. There's no antenna here. It's been removed. Right. Yep. And then, so I think that's Dale, and there's Joe. Okay. Like he's getting out of the... Who is the stripes? Uh, so there's... Yeah, so the stripes are here. You can see them on the... Oh, on the on leg. leg. Okay. Yeah. So you can see... So that's, that's Dale. That's Joe. So Joe's removing the uh, MMU, and he's just going back in. And these are the FSSs right here. Uh, that's for the, that's the foot support. So you just kind of... Yeah. Oh, you like stand on yeah. those. Okay. Yeah, and so they got a satellite there. Now, what's next is the A-frame. So what they're going to do is they're going to put a frame kind of around the antenna that's folded around it. On these, okay. Right, so you can see there's kind of a gap. So I'm going to put it across there on these parts. Okay, okay. Right? I think I see and that. that's going to have a grapple fixture on it so that the RMS can pick it, flip it over, and then they can mount it onto the attach point. Okay. Okay. I see what they're doing. So they're putting the thing on there so that way they can grab it on the on the proper side yeah. and then put it in. And then right. they can mount it in. Except there's a problem. So this this is the A-frame. Okay. You can kind of see it in this picture, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's it's a white yeah. object in front of a white background. So here's a problem. The blueprints that Hughes sent to I think I don't know who built the A-frame. It's not JPL. I think it's APL. Applied Physics Laboratory, someone at NASA, okay. did not include a traveling wave tube that interfered with the frame. So the, the schematics they had were wrong? Yes, for both satellites. Oh. So the A-frame doesn't fit. Oh, no. Yep. So now they have to go to plan B. You know what plan B is? Uh, brute force? Improvise. <laughs> so there is Joe holding onto the satellite. Oh, so he's just flipping yeah. it over manually. Yeah. And when you, if you watch the video of this, it's just so weird. Here he is holding this thousand-pound satellite. He's just kind of moving around. Here you go, <laughs> waving it around. Yeah. So here he is holding this giant satellite, and he's mounted, you know, in the payload bay. Apparently, that was pretty scary too. Because <laughs> oh, yeah, because okay. it was either him or Dale. At some point during this, they couldn't really see around them. <laughs> They could sort. The approach they could see over the edge of the shuttle and nothing else. <laughs> so it's kind of scary. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so yeah. So he's gonna hold on to it while they remove the grapple fixture and then attach. Uh, so this is the frame that they're gonna use to attach it to the pallet there. So this is it stowed okay. and this is the. So they're gonna attach it to the bottom. Then they have three bolts to bolt it down into the payload bay. Okay. Right, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. So it's the thing that they're sticking on the the back, so that way you can put it into the shuttle. Yeah, so you can mount it into the shuttle. Yeah. Right. So he, so here he is. Uh, here's Dale. He's removed the uh, the capture device, 
And then Joe's just mm-hmm. sk- sk- moving around. <laughs> <Just hold Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Which is really cool. <laughs> so had that worked, so I would have repositioned the satellite and then put this on the bottom. So instead, Joe's acting like the RMS. <laughs> okay. And then Dale's just mounting that to the bottom. And then they'll berth the satellite. You know, they'll mount it in. And then they'll remove the A-frame and a- apparently do a layup. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> do a little exercise. Yeah. You, know, you gotta Woo. get in, yeah. put in your glutes. Yep. <sighs> and they just throw that. Get that. Little exercise. So you can see, yeah. here it is, and it worked. <laughs> There's the satellite. They recover. Who needs a ridiculously expensive machine when you could just get a guy out there and hold yep. it? Yep. <laughs> uh, yeah. So that's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so then, mission day six is for rendezvous maneuvering, maintenance, and recharge of the emus. They do more science experiments, and then they goofed off. <laughs> so if you watch the video of this you can so joe allen's pretty tiny so uh-huh. they made it look like he was stowed stowed in one of these uh containers and there's dale <laughs> pulling him out right so he said he's, you know, he's hiding there and it makes it look like they're pulling him out <laughs> yeah, you can see they have the treadmill on the flight there too oh yeah, yeah. The, the one's there. so mission day seven this is the recovery okay. of west star six EV1 this time is Dale Gardner, but he still has no stripes. And then EV2 is Joe Allen. Uh, I think Joe was pretty tuckered out after doing this. And he said, Dale, you get to do it. You're younger than me. (laughs) (laughs) And it's the same positions for everybody before. Uh, So now this, of course, will incorporate changes to the recovery methods from Palapa, obviously. Uh, Right. Yeah. And this EVA is only five hours and 42 minutes instead of six hours. Oh, nice. They're they're getting better. They're shaving down their time. Yep. So there is Dale with the satellite, bringing it back okay. in. So then there is the RMS. He, so I think this is... So again, they changed the procedures for this. Yeah, so I think he's... Oh, that's Joe. He's probably... I don't know. Oh, he's good, probably holding onto the satellite now. Or they figured out how to do it differently. Again, not much detail you can find. And then there is the kick motor. Yeah, because so if that's the kick motor and they're holding it, if they're grabbing it from the top, yeah, then yeah, they probably change the procedure to just like stick it on the top. Well, no, stick something. Well, no, on the I top. think it's just I think he's holding on to the top now. Okay. With the RMS, who so doesn't drift away? I guess. Ah, right. Okay. Yeah, yeah it makes sense. It's a shame again. It's a shame there's not much information on this. <laughs> Cause it's a really yeah, cool mission. Awesome. Yeah, satellite recovery. So now they've recovered these satellites, which is, uh, Dale was gonna be the first one to, to announce that they'd succeeded but said no, no no rick you get to do it this is your mission he's the commander and he wanted to say yeah it's an effing miracle because no one had ever done this before and it, rick was very concerned about this mission because no one had done this so it's very risky and nasa was kind of planning up as oh this will be easy yeah <laughs> they were yeah if they were going to recover one satellite they'd consider that a miracle <laughs> they got both of them and during this Dale produced a for sale sign. <laughs> this is also one of the most iconic images of the shuttle program. It is, if you follow these things. And there are the two spacecraft recovered. <laughs> Look at that. Yeah. And then, so there they are from another angle. <laughs> That's great. Isn't this an iconic image? This is, it is fantastic. It's such a cool mission. <laughs> it is so cool. So yeah. then mission day eight, uh, they do a hot fire test of the primary RCS. They check out the flight control system, and they stow everything to prepare for return. And whip out the camera to get these awesome oh, yeah. images of them in shades. I couldn't <laughs> find one of Joe Allen with sunglasses, so unfortunately. But yeah, yeah. this is them being cool. Because come on, you just recovered two satellites. <laughs> Yeah, apparently, in space. Yeah, apparently either Joe or Dale during this period, uh, during the last two days of the mission, would during breaks just go up and take a peek in the payload bay just to, just to see, oh, yeah, I actually did that. <laughs> yeah. And to make sure it's still there, yeah. right? Did we sell this properly? <laughs> it's right there when I left it. <laughs> oh, did it just grow legs and walk away? Oh, no. <laughs> uh, yeah, and that's the reason I included these pictures also, because they look so cool. Yeah, that's so awesome. Yeah. So in flight day nine, they do the deorbit burn on orbit 126. They land at Kennedy Space Center on November 16th, 1984 at 7 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. 
which interestingly enough, that's the day same November 16th was also the day that I think Joe Allen's flight landed at STS five, two years apart. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, So the flight time was seven days, 23 hours, 44 minutes and 56 seconds. Okay. So less than eight days on flight day nine. Yeah. Roughly. That makes sense. Yeah. And then, so this will actually be one of the last uses of the MMU. The okay. last untethered spacewalk until STS-64. Okay. Yeah, because it's actually kind of dangerous. Again, they could have just drifted oh. off. No. <laughs> ah, you're just going to go quick drift off real quick. Yeah, I'm going to take a nap. Just in space. Yeah, I'm going to take a nap. <laughs> Where did the shuttle go? <laughs> oh, no. Oh. And it, uh, honestly, they could have recovered it. There's procedures for that. But, you know, you don't want to do it. Uh, yeah. The, so there are a few more recovery missions with the shuttle, but nothing like this, if I recall. So this was the first and coolest. Oh, yeah. Again, of... one of the coolest space shuttle missions ever. That's why I wanted to talk <laughs> about it. Yeah, that's awesome. Because, come on, you get to do that. <laughs> that's it's iconic. All right, so we're going to go into the results of the mission now. And I want to say it right here. I couldn't find any of the scientific results. For the radiation monitor, I did find some results. Mm-hmm. And it was, so they got about 0.23 to 0.24 millisieverts per hour okay. in the can. What does that mean? Means they're fine. Okay. Yeah. All right. So this is, of course, the clearest picture. Actually, I did find one that was a screenshot, but it's a screenshot of the IMAX movie, The Dream is Alive, and I don't know the copyright status of that. So uh, so we'll go with the crunchiest JPEG. Yeah, the, uh, the hand-drawn conceived, one. Conceived, right? <laughs> Crafted out of memory. Yeah, this is from the great pixel shortage of 84. Mm. So what happened to our satellites? So Onyx D2 became SATCOM 4R in 1991, moved to 81 degrees west. Then it became ArabSat 1D in 1993, at 20 degrees east. So it's actually hovering over uh, kind of where Ghana is, if you know where that is. You don't know where that is, do you? I th- it's, yeah, no. You I know how Africa kind of has that hump and then it goes down? Right? This is where South America, mm-hmm. yeah, they put them together. Oh, it's yeah, it's yeah, part yeah. of the part yeah. where you can go straight south in the ocean. That's where Ghana is. That's, so it's hovering over okay. there. Okay. It was retired on January 31st, 1995. Mm. Syncom 4 1 was retired at some point. Before 2015, because that's when the last one was retired. Okay. So retired, you, when you say retired, is that like the Blade Runner retired? I mean, they pushed it to a higher orbit and turned it off. Oh, okay. I mean, that's what you do in Blade so Runner. They turned them off in Blade Runner, too. Just a bit more yeah, violently. They, yeah, they did it with guns as opposed to, like, a computer code. Yeah, they just turned it off. Okay, so Palapa B-2 was refurbished and launched as Palapa B-2R on a Delta II on April 13th, 1990 and placed at 107.7 degrees east over Indonesia. It's a Palapa satellite. It was retired on September 24th, 2000. Hmm. Uh, Westar 6 was refurbished and sold to a Hong Kong-based telecom as AsiaSat-1. So it was for sale. (laughs) <laughs> yeah so this one launched on april 7th 1990 so about a week before palapa uh by a long march 3 to 100.3 degrees east so it's yeah it's over central asia or yeah it was then moved to 122 degrees east in 1999 before retiring in january 2003 so 20 years ago so they so they were both relaunched yeah <laughs> ah, so, dang yeah reusable satellites who knew because the satellites yeah. were fine i mean they cut off the tops of them but you can fix that yeah I mean, yeah the engine fell off and then they cut off the tops of them but you know it's just a fixer upper yeah you know, this astronaut manhandling them the whole time <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh so here's the thing we about... want yeah we found these satellites on ebay under the used category yeah that'd be really funny i don't use ebay <laughs> I haven't used eBay in a while. Sometimes I look for stuff, like space stuff. Can you find, like I once found a Rotary Rocket laptop case. But that's, it's one, that's awesome. Yeah, but it's you one could of, probably find some uh, some satellites. Yeah, some dead satellites. <laughs> Flown once, never used. It's got some good miles on it. 
<laughs> Oil's still good. Yeah, I need to fix the antenna, though. <laughs> Do you, guys, you know what I'm thinking about, though? What does that smell like? Uh, oh, yeah, has the <laughs> has the used satellite smell. Yeah. <laughs> Probably, like, burned metal That's or whatever it is. And yeah. Because it's been exposed to space for, you know, nine months. Yeah. They're just sitting up there. Hopefully it doesn't smell like cigarettes. What else are you going to be doing to pass the time up there? Get the last tray, you know? <laughs> that's what, yeah. that's why they couldn't put the A-frame on. That's what they Hughes forgot to put on. Yeah, in the schematics. It's got an ashtray. Picked up the habit to look cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there were a bunch of cigarette butts in the way. We couldn't mount it properly. Yeah, <laughs> start to dead to de- 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 debris. <laughs> yeah. So now, actually, the crew was awarded Lloyd's Silver Medal for extraordinary exertions that have contributed to the preservation of property from evils of all kinds. <laughs> What a title. Yes. <laughs> so Lloyd's is one of the oldest insurance companies in the world. Oh, These are the guys how old who, are they? Uh, I, I think as early as the 1700s. They're based in oh. England. They're like for the original colonial period, like for like the East India Company and those kinds of people. Like, oh. these, these guys are old. They'll insure anything. They're, like, <laughs> they're old and they're respected, right? Okay. And yeah, so they actually uh, rang the bell they have a bell to ring for either tragedy or good news. Mm. And they rang it because two satellites were recovered for insurance <laughs> yeah. purposes. Yeah. Property from evils of all kinds. <laughs> uh, Anna, uh, Anna Fisher is actually the second woman to ever receive that. Who's the first? I don't, I don't know. But I mean, that, Some woman. awesome. <laughs> Some woman. I don't know. <laughs> well, clearly a woman. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they did this. They recovered two satellites. That is awesome. That is so yeah. awesome. You know, again, uh, that's my Facebook profile picture if I was Dale. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Like high school reunion, you know, you go back in. So what did you do? <laughs> I recovered a satellite. I, oh, you know. Yeah, recovered a satellite. They recovered two satellites. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know. And so then, of course, during the mission, they did this, right? The eagle flies high. They got their the logo was the eagle. I couldn't figure out the name of the eagle. I just know that they had the eagle as kind of their symbol. I don't know why. Okay. Uh, so, of course, you know, two up, two down, ace, repo, co. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> the sky's no limit. <laughs> yep. Taking it down from orbit. <laughs> yeah. It's, again, this is such a cool mission. Yeah. <laughs> it's one of my favorites. Oh, yeah, just going to go quick up into space real quick and then, you know, grab these satellites and bring them back down. Yeah. You know? Can you imagine just a, something no, that's never been done before? I'm just going to quick do it. And thinking of Thanksgiving, they're back in November, right? They go to Thanksgiving next week. Oh, so what would you do at work? <laughs> yeah. Let me tell you. <laughs> yeah. Created some iconic imagery, you know, the for sale. <laughs> yeah. Or the, Here are my vacation pics. <laughs> yeah, then Anna's kid's going to kindergarten. I don't remember how old her kid was. Oh, no, she had a kid, like, early on in the program. Kid's, like, three or, at this time. But, you know, going to kindergarten, you know, preschool or something. Yeah, so what do your parents do? <laughs> I was in space. Go to, <laughs> yeah. Go to space, receive a, a medal for this awesome accomplishment. <laughs> you know, just, like, casual stuff. The little things. <laughs> yeah. Another day at the office, you know, the nine to five, what can I say? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Only took six hours. Yeah. <laughs> Who did you do a repossession? <laughs> Ace Repo Co. Yeah, I got the tow truck out. <laughs> I just had to grab a satellite and pull oh, it. Oh, yeah. And, you know, do some oh, squats. Actually, while I'm it out does there. remind me Ronald Reagan called them up and talked about this <laughs> with them. And he joked, you know, what kind of weight training are you doing over there, Joe? Because <laughs> we, we got a gym here in the White House, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah so really cool mission yeah really awesome mission yeah so what did we learn today <laughs> i learned that you could just grab satellites yeah it's so cool you just you just take them right and put them in the space shuttle and again go watch the footage of this i've linked it in the description it is awesome he, it, your monkey brain's going, you shouldn't do that. That's a thousand pound satellite. He's just moving it around like it's nothing. Yeah. It's so weird. 
It's, yeah. It's bizarre. Yeah, so I know there so I know there was a repair done to another Lee Sat uh, in the shuttle. And I know Endeavour's first flight flight was actually another satellite recovery, but they didn't bring it back down because it was too big. Oh yeah. It's too big to fit in the payload bay. <laughs> Let's stra- we'll just strap it to the top like a mattress. It'll be fine. Yeah, come on, just fly it. <laughs> We're gonna need a bigger space shuttle. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so well, I also learned that two of the crew on this mission were consultants for the two yeah. opposing asteroid you movies. Know, we should, you know what we should do for a special episode? What should we do? You should watch. We should watch both of those movies and make slides. Like, you'll watch Deep Impact or Armageddon, and then I'll uh-huh. watch the other one, and we'll make slides of mistakes in the movie. I think, I think it would be... Um, uh, hilarious if I did Armageddon and then you did Deep Impact and I talked about all the all the things that got right in Armageddon and you talk about all the things that got wrong at Deep Impact. You won't even need a slide for that. <laughs> you know that NASA actually has a thing where if you're a new mission controller they make you watch the movie and record errors in it. Apparently there are 263 in which Armageddon. One? <laughs> what about Deep not Impact? As... Huh? Do they make you watch Deep Impact? No, it's not as bad in that regard for accuracy. Oh. Well, why not? Like, are you going to watch one and not the other? I, I guess Armageddon was so inaccurate that <laughs> that, that NASA right. makes you uh, watch it. That's, that's part of your training. <laughs> Day one, watch this. <laughs> no! Yeah, in the not-too-distant future, yeah. <laughs> somewhere in time and space, NASA engineers put you in a room... <laughs> And make you watch Armageddon until you go insane. And if you survive and count, yeah. Oh, you only got a hundred errors. Oh, you're not. You're not gonna be. A, yeah. You, you're not gonna be an astronaut with scores yeah. like that. Come on, there's over two hundred. Let's get this right. You're not even gonna be Capcom. <laughs> you get to be mission support. You get to sit in the back and watch the real you're astronauts a, yeah. work. Yeah, you you just in the back of of mission control. You get to sit in the bottom under the, in the, the second level of the space shuttle. Yeah, you sit in the mid deck. There's no windows. Yeah, you sit in the mid deck the whole time. They don't even let you sit up top, ever. Yeah. Oh, you want to do an EVA? You don't get to come along. You get to tidy up the other experiment. Go fix. Don't run that one while we're working. Don't go real ass. Yeah, go, cl- go swab the deck and clear the air filter. Yeah. Actually, that's what they did on the mission. They actually had to, like, take out air filters, get a vacuum out, clean that up. There's pictures of it. Exciting. Yeah, so, yeah, so that was... Oh, also, um, a clerical thing. Uh, two clerical things. Or Okay. So one is, if you want us to do an episode where we talk about Armageddon and Deep Impact, because they are shuttle missions, Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we can do that. I want to do yeah, that. But then just, yeah. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe. If this gets a <laughs> thousand <this> videos, likes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> also, do, do share it with people. I do want to get this thing going. Uh, especially now that I've, I've fixed my, the sound, I hope. I yeah. hope I fixed the sound. Uh, and the second one is we are going to do a live stream together on October 28th, I think, for Halloween. Uh, we're going to do Left 4 Dead, which has nothing to do with space flight, unless you consider the fact that Earth is in space. That's that's the bare minimum. Yeah, and if that, uh, of course, we're still aware of the technical de- technical details of that. Uh, so if uh, so, that doesn't work out, I'll do Dead Space Two or something. But we'll, I'll let you know when, once we get this thing all worked out. So that's those two things. Uh, so the next mission we're going to talk about is I should have done Deep Impact that mission just as a joke. <laughs> that's a, that's a mission. That's where we hit a comet. <laughs> yeah, I got some good iconic <laughs> imagery too. And so we're going to talk about Deep Space One. What do you think that's about? Um, I think it's about um, what was it about? I think there's like a, a Bajoran like a space station yeah. uh, that uh, there's like a wormhole, yeah. and then there's there's a uh, there's Captain Captain Cisco. Well, this is the prequel. Um, this is Deep Space One. See, this is the this is the early Bajoran oh. space stations. Ah, uh, got it. Yeah, those those are. Yeah, those don't look like anything like the, yeah. the Bajoran yeah. space station. Well, we had to work on it. Ah, right. That makes sense. Yeah. So, yeah, it was the first iteration. They got to go, you know, two through eight, and then they get. Yeah, there's nine. a few more uh, deep space stations they got to build. Actually, this one doesn't. Yeah, this one sense. does involve comets. Actually, this is this is a comet. 
And you can see it swooshing by it, just like an Armageddon. <laughs> yes. Uh, let's see if there's anything else we need to cover for this episode. We learned about one of the cool space shuttle missions. This is a short episode again. I don't know why these keep getting shorter and shorter. Uh, it's because we get, keep getting better and better. I mean, th think about it. The first one took six hours. The second one took five hours and 42 minutes. That's, right? Yeah, that's true. This is our first yeah. operational episode. It's the fifth yeah, one. The first one, it's actually working. Yeah. yeah. So. Oh, oh, yeah. Actually, the, the third thing I would remember. Does this format work? Is this cool how I start off with, uh, here's, on the, here's what's on the shuttle, here's who's flying the mission, here's the experiments, here's what happens, and then here's the results. I think this is good for what we're doing. Please you leave your responses in 12-point you know, font, Times New Roman, double-spaced, and be sure to use complete uh, sentences, complete paragraphs, yeah. and no spelling and no grammar errors and if we're not, in your response. And if we're, not doing, it, and if we're doing it right, uh, write in all caps and insult us. If we're doing it wrong, yes. use the proper format. And if there are any Canadians, uh, please remain silent. Yeah. We do not care about your opinions. We'll, we'll know, because you'll spell color wrong. Yeah, stop putting a U in yeah. there for no go, reason. There's no U in go color. Go eat some poutine or whatever atrocity that is. <laughs> Actually, poutine does sound kind of good. Isn't that where you put gravy on french fries? I have no idea, and that does not sound good. Go go back to drinking maple syrup and watching hockey. Oh, like the rest of you Canadian degenerates. That's a bit offensive there. Okay, I'm sorry. You should be because the next mission. I'm yeah, sorry. hopefully there's no Canadian. What? What even? Hopefully there's nothing Canadian on our next shuttle mission. Because <laughs> we have to get, we have to start getting up to slur. We have to start finding them. You know, we'll bring up the War of 1812. That's what we'll do next time. <laughs> yes, I'll do research of the War of 1812 and start making historical jokes. No one will get. Good. All right then. So we got this. The next episode, Deep Space One, with actual raw data. Heck yeah. You have the outro. Oh yeah, this has been End of Mission. <laughs>